is um, from Anjali, who is the Director of Information and Data Compliance at the University of Warwick. She's a fully qualified solicitor uh, specialising in data protection and associated privacy legislation. Uh, she has an HE background of experience of leading and preparing and implementing the GDPR in an HE setting. Anjali. Good afternoon, um, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I'm here to give you a quick overview about the minimum requirements of a data protection compliance agreement in a contract. When I was looking at contracts a year ago um, to look at legacy arrangements, I was finding a lot of contracts were saying when it came to the data protection paragraph, I agree to abide by the terms of the Data Protection Act 1998, or I agree to keep everything confidential. And that was all there was on um, the data protection paragraph, which is not a lot really. So um, having looked at the GDPR, you know, and the requirements on the data controller, <coughs> I thought it would be good to have a bit of like a crib session on what's required on, the, on this type of um, arrangement. The focus I've got today is on procuring the services of a data processor. So whether you're looking at an HR system that you're looking to procure, whether you're looking, like, uh, looking at an online toolkit to procure for your students for learning, or whether you're looking at a cloud hosting platform, you know, you're looking at a data processing agreement. Um, what I tend to do is, because I have a very short turnaround period, from when I'm given instructions to look at a data protection agreement and um, the delivery of it, what I tend to do is I tend to run the commercial terms separately to the data protection terms. So the commercial terms will be dealt with by a contract specialist, a commercial specialist, and I would focus on the um, data protection terms. I tend to wrap all of them up in a data compliance schedule and, um, I, and that would reflect my privacy impact assessment. And also I've got an appendix to the data compliance schedule called security measures, so specific to that particular arrangement. Um, what's really important, I think I'm gonna skip back, what's really important is that if the privacy impact assessment requirements are not followed under the data protection legislation. Under Article 83, you can get fined up to 2% of global turnover. So that's important to remember when you are looking at whether you should take risk or not risk of assessing a supplier for under the privacy impact assessment requirements. So these, these next few slides are the clauses I like to put in a data protection compliance schedule and these are the requirements so it's not like i've gone off on a whim and said look i want to put these in they are a requirement so what i've done is for each slide i've given the associated article at the bottom i've not really gone into the recitals because sometimes there's quite a few recitals so i've just focused on the article and um, given a brief sort of description at the top of what the clause should entail so the first one is supplier of services as a data processor. I've seen a lot of agreements where we are sort of procuring the services of a supplier, but they're not sort of, sort of defined as a processor. That's really, really important that you understand that because of the liabilities and the obligations that follow on from those definitions. So if, you're, if you don't say that your supplier is a processor, and then they start instruct, they start working with the data as if it's their own, are they then the data controller? So make sure you've got that set out at the outset. And, that's a and the definitions of a data controller and data processor are in Article 4, and obviously there's a section 1 of the DPA under the current legislation. The Article 28 is the main article for any processing activities when you're procuring services from a supplier. So one Article 28.3 actually asks you to put very specifically in your agreement processing detail. So this would mean this, this would set out the subject matter, the duration, the nature, and the purpose of processing, 
the type of personal data that is processed and the categories of data subjects and the duties and rights of the data controller. So what I've done is I've, I use DC and DP in my own notes. So I've used DC for data controller and DP for da data processor. So if you see that on my slides, that's what I mean. And I've already sort of gone over the relevant legislative provision, which is the tw Article 28.3. Then the next thing you have to really specifically say under, under Article 28 is that the supplier is acting on this set of instructions. It's really, really important. Otherwise, you're exposed as the university or as, you know, an SV to uh, non-compliant processing by the supplier. And if there's a breach, the supplier will say, well, I wasn't given any instructions. I've come across this situation, so please be very careful on this. Do document your instructions. Um, and your commercial terms should also specify the scope of the service that's being provided by the supplier. It's, it needs to be in very clear instructions. And the related provision is Article 28.3. And there are obviously paragraphs 11 and 12 of the Schedule Part 1, uh, sorry, Schedule 1, Part 2 of the DPA under current legislation. The other one, again, Article 28, it's your go-to article for engaging suppliers for, uh, as processors. Um, you have to document that when, you are, when a supplier is engaging a third party, like a sub-processor, for example, so you're procuring a service, for say an HR system from a particular company in the private sector, they then go ahead and have a sub-processor like a cloud hosting solution. You need to ensure that the terms that they contract with the sub-processor are on the same terms that you've contracted them on. That's very, very important. Otherwise, it's gonna be a discrepancy in obligations. And you also need to ensure that the first processor remains liable for everything. Make sure you say that in your, in, in your contracts. And that's Article 28.4. In fact, you can just copy verbatim what's written in 28.4 and just throw it in as a clause in, in your contracts. Um, the other thing under Article 28.3b is confidentiality. Confidentiality is key. The legislation has, expects that, your, that the, the processing staff of the processor are committed to confidentiality, whether that's express confidentiality under the contract or whether it's implied or whether there's a statutory duty under a, legis and under a piece of legislation. And uh, under, under Article 528, Article 32, Article 35, it's very key that you insist that the supplier has trained staff on DPA, data protection, that are processing your personal data for your particular arrangement. It's really, really important. Um, we've come across, I've come across that, and it, it gets very, very difficult and very, very tricky when you're in a breach situation. The supplier also has a requirement to assist the data controller on, um, in various instances. So this would be, I think the uh, previous speakers have alluded to data subject requests. Um, security of uh, processing and um, the duties to the ICO and the duties to the data subject in case of a breach and data protection impact assessments because obviously when you're starting off life on a new proposed agreement or a renewal you have to start off life on a PIA whether it's a short PIA or whether it's a long PIA and your supplier needs to assist you on that and also for prior consultation security measures. I'm actually going quite fast because I don't have a lot of time and it's quite a big topic. So, um, but there will be a session on Q&As at the end, won't there be David? So I can cover some questions then. Um, security measures. When I've been dealing with suppliers, I've had a lot of pushback from suppliers on security measures. They say it's confidential, they say it's business critical data. So, you know, if you ask a supplier, you know, I want to see your security accreditation, like your cyber essential certificate, or I want to see your ISA certificate, very often you'll have a supplier say, no, but that's confidential, you know, and you need, to, you need that documentation. 
because the obligation remains with you as a data controller to be accountable for that particular set of processing. You can't get away from it, so make sure that you've got that certificate. Also, what you should have is something called a security impact assessment. Some people call it a security impact assessment, some call it an information security workbook, some call it a supplier due diligence. These are different terms. I call it a security impact assessment because I like <coughs> that it's consistent with the terminology of a privacy impact assessment. In this security impact assessment, you'll do a due diligence on the supplier. So yeah, you look at the security accreditation, you look at their, um, you know, pen testing, their, their vulnerability testing, you know, their patch testing, all those sort of questions that will be picked up. And you are within your rights to ask that. And that's the sort of level and detail that the ICO will drill down to if there is a breach. So whenever you're sort of arranging something with a supplier, you have to have in the forefront of your mind, if there is a breach, am I protected when you're looking at these agreements? Why I also have is, like I alluded to earlier on, a security measures appendix. It kind of um, follows the I ISO 27001, so it gives me a bit more security when I'm looking at agreements. And I feel, yeah, you know what, I've got this just right to the T, it's 27001. But having said that, each security measure needs to be geared and tailored and be specific to that particular processing activity. So it's not an exhaustive list. So every, it's not a blank template. A lot of times people say to me, oh, Anjali, let, give me a template and that's it. Yeah, I can give you a template, but one size doesn't fit all. And you have to remember that when you're dealing with these sort of things, especially when your name's on that document, you have to make sure it's, it's just right. Um, there's another provision that sort of stipulated under Article 28.3c, and it sort of goes in hand in hand with Article 32. And this is to say that it's the supplier's responsibility to ensure that the measures it puts in place are sufficient to comply with the data protection legislation. And people miss that one. It's really important because when technology moves it on, you need to be able to catch up with it. You as a supplier, so you as a data controller, you know, you're not the technology expert, you know, sort of thing. The supplier will need to sort of look at that and make sure that's in your contracts. Um, when it comes to a, day, to a data breach, we've only got 72 hours. We've all sort of discussed this throughout the day today. It's imperative that you put in your contracts that the supplier tells you ASAP if there's a breach as soon as possible. David said earlier on, Friday, bank holiday Monday, you know, when is the supplier going to tell you? I've had a lot of pushback on this. This one and the indemnity clause is why I've had a lot of pushback on. But make sure you say as soon as possible. Your supplier will come back to you. They'll say 24 hours, 48 hours, 7 hours. You need to pick that time and you need to say, this is what I want. And you need to be forceful about this. Okay. Requests from data subjects. Again, we've talked about data subjects today. We've said that, you know, we've only got 30 days, no fee. We, we, we're all expecting, um, you know, data subject access requests to be pouring in come May 2018. You know, at the moment, I've got loads. I've got one that I'm looking at. It's about, like, 2,000 pages long. Well, I'm not, but one of my team is. So, you know, it's quite complicated. It, um, it's not from a student. It's from an employee. So it, it, it's a difficult one. Uh, people always think students. People forget employees. And um, it is imperative that you put in there that the supplier, the processor, assists you with data subject access requests without any costs to you and without undue delay. It's imperative that you include that as a clause so that you can meet your obligations for the 30-day statutory time limit for requests for, from data subjects. Um, audits. This is another one suppliers and processors don't like. They hate this one. Um, they don't want us to look at their, docu their documentation. They don't want us to look at their pen test, whether they passed it or not, or any of their vulnerability testing. 
you need to make sure this is included. You also sometimes will be required to do a site visit. You know, remember this, this is key. Nobody likes doing site visits because suppliers don't look at you happily. They, they, they don't really like you that much, but you know, this, they like you when they want the deal, but they don't like you after that. So, so um, be careful of that one. And that's in Article 28.3H, very specifically sort of um, legislated to sort of make sure that the data controller knows what the supplier is doing with the um, uh, uh, personal data of what they're legally responsible for. Do keep that one in mind. Um, the other one that's very interesting is the register of treatments. The supplier, the processor is required to keep a register of all their processing activities. Make sure that you put in your clause uh, on this that, make, that include us in that register of processing because the ICO will want to look at it. Um, the other one is that the supplier processor should be saying to you without undue delay, if they think one of your instructions contravenes the data protection legislation, make sure you put that in there because you won't know otherwise and they'll just carry on and you're in trouble. Everything comes back to you because you're accountable as data controller. Data transfers, a lot of universities think that they don't do any data transfers outside the EEA, they do. When you work with ex uh, external partners in other countries, you're sending student lists, when you're work working with recruitment agents, when you're working with sponsors, you are actually transferring data outside the EEA. Also, when you're sending emails, you know, with lists, you know, you are doing, you, you are engaging in data transfers. Your starting point with any supplier should be that no transfers are permitted outside the EEA unless they have your permission. Now, what I, ha I haven't specifically included on purpose, intentionally included countries that have adequate uh, data protection, so they're adequate for data protection, like Canada. The reason why I haven't done that is because Canada's adequacy decision is up for renewal in four years, and uh, this, this, this keeps changing, who's on the list and who isn't on the list keeps changing. So it's really, really important that if you are going to transfer outside the EEA, that you then keep an eye on it and you keep, keep it carefully monitored. And also, another thing I haven't really gone into because I don't have time for this session, is that when you are talking about transfers of data outside, say for your cloud hosting solution, you should be looking at model contracts. And a key thing about model contracts is you can't tamper with them, so you can't add to them. So when you are drafting up your data protection agreement, what you need to say to yourself is, right, I've got to sort of put in model contracts in now. They're available on the EU side. So you get data, controller to controller and you get controller to processor. So, you know, just go and pick, them, pick one of those out. That suits your arrangement. What people tend to do is they tend to add an appendix to it. If you are to, to add an appendix to model contract, invalidates your model contract, so you've made an illegal transfer. So try not to do that, but refer to it as an extra clause in your main agreement, saying that you'll have model contracts and also for this agreement itself, you've also got an added appendix on data protection. Um, then we come to treatment of um, uh, data on termination. What you need to ask for is either return the data, if that's what suits you, or what you ask for is the secure deletion of the data. Um, if the supplier doesn't oblige, they can inadvertently become the data controller. So make sure you're aware of that and have a look and advise your supplier about it. I'm sure they don't want to be data controller. Nobody likes being data controller. But these days, nobody likes being processor either. Um, again, your key article is Article 28. Uh, I said I was going to talk to you about indemnity. Indemnity is not a key requirement under the provisions of a data protection agreement in the sense that it's not a compliance requirement. 
all the other slides and all the other provisions I've talked to you about are compliance requirements. This is more of a commercial term. And um, I've had a lot of pushback on indemnity since I've been, since I've been doing uh, the DPO role. Suppliers don't like indemnity because obviously then they have to look at their insurance to see whether they can cover the um, indemnity and obviously their premiums go up. Now, what very, very often what happens is you've got an indemnity in the main contract, in the commercial contract, so your value of the contract is, say, 40000 a year, right? So your indemnity in, indemnity in the commercial contract will only cover you for forty grand. You know, let, you know that's what we normally agree, the value of the contract. What people forget about is putting an indemnity in for a data protection breach. Really important because really costly to deal with the aftermath of a breach. You've got your legal claims, you've got your compensation, you've got your resource issues, you've got your investigation, you've got your disciplinaries, you've got your communications with the ICO, do you get a specialist team in to deal with the aftermath? Very, very costly. You want to get this sorted out at the outset and you will get pushback. I was dealing with a contract that required that was, that was, I think, yeah, that's, that was £40,000 for two years and the indemnity only covered us for 40000 Now, this was an HR system and you can imagine the kind of detail that goes in the HR system. Supplier wasn't having it. Supplier said that they deal with government. Nobody's ever asked them for this type of indemnity before. And I've always get, I always get this, I deal with government, I deal with the police, I deal with other universities. You're the only university asking me for this. I'm sure you all get that as well, right? So we all should start talking about all this sort of stuff. And um, I, I managed to get an indemnity to the value of 200 from 40 because at that particular time, the um, executive sponsor was happy to go up to 200, but no more than 200 because they really wanted this system. But at least it was a bit of an achievement from 40 to 200. So it's important that's, um, that's actually sorted out. Um, and what also, if they want an unlimited, sorry, if they wanted to limit, to limit their liability in terms of the commercial contract, make sure that your data compliance schedule is carved out of that indemnity. That's really important. So, yeah, you can have your commercial coverage for your indemnity, but don't touch data protection. You know, it's too expensive for the university to otherwise manage it. It would be too costly. Um, but you'll be in demand. Um, and also, if there is, what I tend to have is a unlimited liability in all my contracts. You need to talk to your procuring team and say to them, don't touch the indemnity. If you're going to touch it, talk to us first. Okay? And the relevant, relevant legislation, obviously, for any breaches, as you know, is Article 83. What I've got here is a little crib sheet that I did for myself and for my team. And uh, this basically is like, if you've got a contract agreement, the relationship and the requirement. So this is just like a tool that I sort of like to put things down when I try and make staff understand you know, this is what we need to put in, in terms of a legal document. So where do I use a data sharing agreement? I would use a data sharing agreement in a controller to controller type situation. So where I've got, like, say, a, a partner or where I've got an accreditation body. So I'd use a data sharing agreement there. Um, sometimes you have an inst institutional agreement. Um, but it's an institutional commercial agreement. So when you've got something like that, you need to slot in your data compliance schedule, subject to the fact that it covers whatever was unearthed in your PIA. Um, sometimes you get a supplier legal contract and they've got nothing on data protection, and you say, right, our starting point has to be our data compliance schedule. And then I've already covered accreditation bodies, which are controller to controller, what I also find these days is what we're looking at is auditors knocking on our doors, whether it's the Research Funding Council, their auditors, or whether it's PricewaterhouseCoopers, 
And if you look at their contracts, they've got a general contract and the data protection provisions are quite poor. So what you need to have is a external auditing data provision agreement. And if they don't agree to it, I throw everything in an email and say, right, I'm providing you this information on this basis. So I take it all out and put it in the body of an email. So um, that's what I do. I've, that's my email. If anybody wants to talk to me about any of this or contact David and perhaps he can put somebody in touch with me. I've done it in time, I hope. Yeah.